Well, I just want to start off with uh, thank you for coaching our women's team, but also just representing our country. Um, when I was watching you guys in like the 80s, and I think from Marv Dunphy and Doug Beal was the first time I felt inspired to not just be an athlete, but to be proud to be an American athlete and to play with such patriotism, which I think is something that we often forget. Um, we're so privileged to be in this country, and you often talk about your dad coming from the Soviet Union. Not from a lot Hungary, of, which yeah. was eventually uh, controlled like a puppet state by the Soviet Union, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And my parents, they escaped China during the, the Civil War. Okay. And I remember in 2008, during the Olympics, we're all watching as a family, and my parents are full Chinese, but they escaped to Hong Kong and then came here for university. And I asked them, saying, who are you cheering for between China and U.S.? And I'm expecting them to say China. And we're very proud to be Chinese, our cultural yeah. heritage. But I was really surprised at that time to hear my dad say, well, I'm cheering for America. And I thought, why? He's like, that's the country that gave me opportunity. And the other one didn't. Simple as that. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, I had a chance to talk with Marv Dunphy, too. Okay. And really cool to see He's you guys. He's one of our favorite people, and he just got here yesterday. Yeah, and he keeps downplaying his role. He's like, I'm just, I'm just an old guy. I don't know why they keep no, asking no. me He's, out. He, we love him. He's, He's awesome. He's our sage. So I would love to hear, like, why, why do you continue to have him on the coaching staff? Well, uh, Marv is one of the best coaches on the planet, one of the best coaches who's ever coached uh, volleyball and maybe for that matter all sports. He's a real devotee of uh, Coach John Wooden, yeah. one of the legends, and did his doctoral thesis on, on Coach Wooden. Mm -hmm. So uh, Marv has just been way ahead of the, the game in lots of ways. I got to play for him and now I consider him a great friend. I'm lucky to call him a coaching mentor of mine. Uh, I admire him so much as a dad and as a husband and as a man and so there's no reason not to like him incredibly and yeah. to have him with his wealth of knowledge, yeah. 10, 11 Olympic experiences, yeah. uh, he has seen it all more than anybody I know yeah. and so especially when things come up that could knock us off kilter. Marv is, uh, is a huge stabilizing force for us. Yeah. Uh, he picks his spots when to speak, but when he speaks, his words carry incredible weight with all of us in our program. And so we love Marv, uh, and we're really fortunate. He's getting on in years, and we're really fortunate that he will carve out time to, to spend with us. He makes us yeah. better. He, he might not say it. He might not agree with it but yeah. it makes us better and we're lucky that anytime we get to have him around so true i think great people make other people great yeah um and i can see just a really really nice relationship between you two and just just having his presence there i think like you said a stabilizing force for the players um i'm curious how many of the players actually knew who him before you asked him on the staff because he retired a while ago um he did retire a while ago, but he has been a great presence with USA. Oh, okay. Of course, he uh, he was at the 84 Olympics yeah. helping the broadcast team, then he coached 88, mm -hmm. and then he's been at almost every Olympics since then. He coached in Sydney, he helped in, in 04 in Athens, helped the men win a gold in, 19, in uh, 2008 yeah. in Beijing. He was with our women in 2012 in uh, London, yeah. with us in Rio in 2016, so he's a really consistent presence. Uh, not there every day, not there for every competition, but yeah. our players both adore him and, um, and revere what, uh, his insights. Yeah. And so that's a powerful combination. Absolutely. Yeah, when I stopped him, so when I was in the tunnel, um, I stopped and I said, hey coach, do you mind for interview? It's like, oh, I'm actually not on the coaching staff. <laughs> he like, is, he's not uh, on the bench, uh -huh. but he is a consultant coach oh, of yeah. ours. We have some, some great people who are not considered like full-time staff members. It's hard to express enough gratitude for all he's meant to uh, all the parts of USA Volleyball over, year, over the years, but especially the Olympic campaigns that people put on for many yeah. years, the men, and now for many Olympics, the women. Absolutely. One thing I noticed that I've seen like different wrinkles in the new offense of some slide 
maybe some, I don't know what you call in the US agent, like 40s or like C quicks. So like a, a yeah, okay, maybe just behind the setter out of the back. Yeah, so yeah, you got the slide drawn the slide, in the middle. And then a C right behind and a yeah. back in front of that. And then the go. We have been running that some uh, over the years, trying to get that more. The yeah. slide will pull that, uh, that wing blocker out and there's yeah. a nice lane to attack in. Yeah, uh, had some success with that in the last few years uh, in Tokyo when nice. we won the gold medal there. Uh, setting up a couple of key opposites for us: JT mm. Jordan Thompson and Annie Drews. And mm. Annie's not here with us this week, but we're trying to get that dialed in. Yeah, uh, this group we had only six of the fourteen that are here were with us in week one, so mm. it's an unusual week. We're six returning and eight new, wow. eight new faces, including Micah Hancock, including Jordan Thompson. Yeah. And so the team, this group of 14 has only had uh, four or five days to work together. So, wow. uh, so we're working through, it's not always gonna be pretty, not always yeah. gonna have the rhythm, but our objective is to get it a little better each time. And so you're probably seeing some good and some lousy in the slide C, uh -huh. in the gap D, in the whatever that we're trying to run to get our back row routes going for our very capable opposites. Yeah, and that's been exciting to see. Um, and I, I think I appreciate that as a coach, you're even though you've won gold, number one, you know, one of the top teams in the world, you're still trying to push the envelope and experiment and how can we optimize this group. I remember talking to Doug Beal at the USA High Performance Coaching Clinic and just ask him about the general state another of Another great oh, coach, yeah. great man. Your head coach. And uh, another now good friend and coaching mentor of mine. So I'm, I'm incredibly blessed to have Doug and Marv as mentors of mine. Yeah, just just volleyball main staples you know, of our community. Yeah. And he says he missed the creativity and he feels like volleyball was lacking innovation. But I feel like now it's finally coming back. Because when you played, it was so exciting. Crossing patterns, the BIC was just coming out. The back row attack was becoming a primary offense. Um, and there was a lot more variation. We kind of lost that, I feel like, in the late 90s and like all the way through 2015s, you know, where it was just whoever could run this classical system the best, D-ball, one shoot, and hut, and BIC you know, is going to win. But now to see your team having some really fun combinations, um, I think it brings back the fun and creativity of volleyball. Um, I think it allows athletes, like especially in the men's game, the, the roundhouse is making its way back, the jam, the two-hand throw, like elementary yeah. school stuff. Yeah. And one thing always stuck with me with Doug Beal, he was responding to an open letter from a parent that said a coach told their daughter that she was too short to play volleyball and he said as long as the ball can hit the floor on the other side that's all that matters exactly and so starting from that point and working backwards it should allow a lot of room for creativity yeah right so do you think that was like a conscious move to like well let's let's see how we can diversify our offense or was this like hey these are the group of athletes that we have and these are the routes that are going to maximize their ability I think it's a little of both, um, mm -hmm. for sure. But even last night when we played Canada, you could see connections forming, building, not always ryth in rhythm, not always clean, but there were a couple of what we would call gap, you might call shoot, or 31, and, and overload and, and set the go over that, yeah. uh, from Jordan Poulter to Catherine Plummer, yeah. that were what we would call USA fast. Like, the two sets look almost identical, uh, yeah. and it, uh, baits it, it gets blockers popping on the first one and yeah. then they have no time to get back on the second one. It's the same theory as a one BIC, and the two sets look almost identical. Mm -hmm. And so you could just see the speed dialing in some last yeah. night. Again, it won't all be clean and pretty. The opponent has a lot of say in that. We don't always pass in system, but uh, some really fun stuff developing, and along with that, the slide C, the gap D or 1D, and different things to stress uh, opposing blockers out, whether they're middle blockers or wing blockers. And so we're, we're trying to maximize everybody's abilities and skills, and also exploit weaknesses across the net. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's fun to see that, because not only, I feel like this is like one of the biggest, the tallest groups that we've had in a while, of just, I was looking at the front row, 6'7", 6'5", 6'4", it's just, 
And then you got Justin Wong, right? Holding it down in the back row. But it's, it's, it's great to see tall athletes that can run fast offenses. That's really yeah. exciting. Yeah, somebody like uh, Plum has done plenty of that yeah. with us and in her pro career. Yeah. Jordan Larson's been doing that for years. Kelsey Robinson, yeah. Avery Skinner and others were, uh, when we have a good pass, we would like to stress people with speed. And when we don't, we'll slow it down and get them the swing that they need. Uh, because when you are running fast, the one risk you, you take is reducing a typical, the average hitter, and these are not average hitters, but to reduce their range, how wide of a range they can hit from very sharp cross yeah. to line. And so slowing it down when the pass isn't there, we're trying to increase their range and, and be less about stressing people with speed or with uh, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And then letting the hitter make a choice yeah. off the hand or something. Yeah. Okay. Couple more questions. Sure. Um, I remember you made a comment um, after the 2016 Olympics. That was a really tough round of talk, just talking about jump serving and wanting to see more of that in the gym. So correct me if I'm wrong if I wasn't hearing that correctly. Because um, you know the match against Serbia where they had three really tough top spinners. In the future of USA or where we're at, do you feel like there should be a top spin servers in the gym so we th they can see that, or do you feel like what we teach is going to be sufficient no matter what service we have on our team. We, we, we want to come prepared no matter what the other teams bring it. That makes sense? It does make sense. I think a few thoughts come with jump spinning. When I first took over as head coach of the team, uh, my first full season of coaching was in 2013. Mm -hmm. And second season, of course, was 2014. And in that season, we didn't have a very good uh, World Grand Prix. That's what the NL Volleyball Nations League is now called mm -hmm. in its rebranded and restructured form. We had a number of spin servers. There were at least four. And so we had a lot of spinners. And at that time, those spinners were missing too much, mm -hmm. not hitting the right person enough. Mm -hmm. And in World Grand Prix, by our metrics, we were the worst serving team in that tournament. Uh. So we decided to take the drastic step. Uh, it had been something that Joe Trinzi, who uh, we love uh, as a former member of our staff and a really thoughtful guy with a lot of interesting and, and sharp insights, but he was like, you know, I wonder what would happen if we went to more jump float and, and had some of our jump spinners switch. Yeah. And so we just, we were so, our performance was so poor in World Grand Prix that we said, we're just mandating it. We're going all jump float here. And it wasn't a lot of instruction. All we did was we had some of the best jump floaters on our team go and hit one, and then the person behind her watch and do that, watch mm, and do that. It was cool. just, uh, um, it was very little instruction and a lot of simulation or mimicry. Yeah. We went from the worst serving team to the best serving team in about a month and a half period. They, they wow. got to use those serves for three weeks and then we went and won our first ever major championship, the world championship. Yeah. So we've stuck with it since then. Yeah. Um, it also reduces a lot of wear and tear. When you uh, have a good spin, yeah. pro coaches want you to hit it about a hundred times a day. Yeah. So Jordan Larson, look at what she's doing now. Yeah. I almost guarantee that she would not be here and feeling the way she is yeah. if she had stuck with her spin yeah. the last 10 years. She became one of the best float servers in the world. Yeah. She has a vicious and very dependable and clutch yeah. jump float. Nicole Fawcett turned into a great jump floater. So we even in the double sub in that tournament, we would leave both opposites in and she would serve for uh -huh. Alicia Glass. And we'd play with no setter on the floor because her serve was creating so much, yeah. uh, so many opportunities for us. Yeah. So we love the jump float. We also will not say no if somebody special comes along. And the person who probably has the best jump spin in our gym is Micah Hancock. Yeah. She's tried some of one, some of the other. We have found her jump float to be more efficient, knocks people out of system just as much, probably doesn't ace as much, but goes in a lot more. So the green light is on for her to spin if she wants. 
but there's a lot of wear and tear there also, yeah. and she's not the tallest setter either. So yeah. there's some real benefits. That's a very long way of answering your question. We won't say no to it, but it has to be a special one. It can't be under 60 miles an hour. Yeah. It can't be one that's just a down ball for the other team. You've yeah. got to really have heat, yeah. like uh, the opposite for Canada, number three, Kira Van Rake. Yeah. Um, almost knocked Jordan Larson over with one last night, yeah. like bringing heat. But the only one who really has that kind of heat right now is Micah Hancock. So we go with a lot of jump float, and we bring Back to your question, very long way and roundabout way. That's okay. Sorry, I'm taking got all so the time. Long. We bring in consultant, uh, like practice players, men yeah. who played in college, who will hit. Uh, we had one of our special helper players happen to be in the Dallas area and played a tournament here over the weekend. So we had him hitting those yesterday morning wow. in our gym right here in this venue before awesome. we played Canada last night. So we do get help nice. because we don't have the actual servers except yeah. for Micah, but hers is left-handed. It's very different from yeah. the right-handers. Yeah. And then the last thing I would say is, I could be wrong, but in my belief, we didn't lose in Rio because of the jump spinners. We had an 11-8 lead in the fifth game. Uh, it certainly didn't hurt or it didn't help to lose Feluca for most of that one match that we yeah. lost in the semifinals. But we still put ourselves in a position. We just didn't turn the points when we needed to. Yeah. I think it was much more about Serbia, uh, Ticha Boscovic. Yeah. It was much more about her offense than her serving. Her serving was inconsistent. Uh, so was Mihailovic's. Like they, they were missing a lot. They yeah. weren't hurting us with the spin. In fact, we got aced by a great jump float yeah. late in that match yeah. at 12 all yeah. by one of their middles. And so, so it goes back to jump float in the world of women's volleyball, in my opinion, except for about three or four special servers, yeah. is the most efficient serve at knocking people out of system and yeah. staying in a lot. Not all the time, but in around nine out of 10. Yeah. Because we don't want to be in 100% of the time. We're not serving tough enough if we yeah. do that. Yeah. Well, especially with... Sorry, such... very long answer to your question. No, no. I, I, I appreciate your answers because it's, it's very complete. And I want to make sure I understand the full picture. Because in the volleyball world, people are always going back and forth like, okay, why are they doing this? Or this is working or things like that. And I'm always curious. I want to hear it straight from the yeah. source about um, methodology and philosophy. But that makes sense is if it's not... I think there is an inflection point. It has point to with be elite. Yeah. And we don't have many elite spinners. Yeah. The people who were serving that in 2014 and not doing so well were not elite. And so then they became elite. Mm -hmm. Jordan Larson, Nicole Fawcett. Yeah. Uh, Kelsey's developed a good one. Kelly Murphy developed a good one. Yeah. And, and so we, we actually raised our serving game by hitting the right person a lot more. Yeah or the space around the right person, getting it in a lot more instead of three out of four or eight out of 10, it was, it's now nine out of 10. That's and if you high. watch last night against Canada, we had a really nice serving lineup. Both middles, Asia yeah. and Dana, can serve up a storm. Yeah. And then Plum and Jordan Larson, also good servers. And then Poulter and JT Jordan Thompson. So this is like six gnarly jump floats coming at you one after another. And middles that can play defense. And middles who can play defense. That is exactly. I think you and Hugh talked about that, like one one of the evolutions that you wish would pass into the college game. It's more all around play. And, yeah. and it was so cool to see them get digs, like control digs, backspin, high after net. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was really good to see that. Asia got a lot of chance to do that mm -hmm. in playing for Texas. Mm -hmm. Dana did not. I think she served seven. I was calling, that was one of the last years I worked television, I was calling the regional final uh, Wisconsin uh -huh. on its way to the championship in 2021. Yeah. And Dana hit her eighth serve of the season when the Badgers ran out of serving, uh, ran out of substitutions mm -hmm. and she had to stay in. Uh -huh. And I think she scored the point and uh -huh. they went nuts. She might even have gotten a dig, but we really wished Middles consistently got the yeah. opportunity to serve and defend their serve yeah. that they have to do at the next level, yeah. but it's only an optional thing at the college level. And yeah. it deprives elite middles of some chances to get great at those skills. Well, yeah. I mean, Ryan Millar setting game point in 2008. Exactly. Imagine if a coach said, or McGowan said, hey, you're a middle, you shouldn't set. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, those, those old school players are kind of a, a dying breed 
<laughs> yeah. As a coach, do you have a pre-game routine? I do, although it doesn't always look exactly the same, but I have to accomplish my prep work in terms of prepping for uh, our plan about how we're going to run our substitution patterns, uh, potential, and it's not my decision, we make a group coaching decision, but about what starting rotations, things yeah. like that, that we want. Prepping for the opponent in terms of my the data I want to have handy and things like that. Okay. Making sure my device is charged so that I yeah. can see the stats or yeah. see the video that I need to see. Uh, but there, are, there, are, it, there are some things. It takes a couple hours to, to get prepped for that. Yeah. And so it's not not superstition by any means, but just part of prepping for a very worthy opponent across the net. Okay. And last question: When are we going to see another Karching moment? Because, <laughs> I to me, it was great insight to understand the transition from topspin to jump float, and then winning the first gold medal, right, of the program, which was. I watched it live and I just, it, I remember the moment and that became a huge thing. But when is the next car, I mean, we, you, you did it at the Tokyo Olympics. We need to have one more car moment. When's that next one going to be? Is it going to be gold in Paris? Well, uh, I got, I got really excited um, for both those wins. Yeah. The thing I had small regrets about in terms of my celebration after we won in 2014 is I don't want to draw attention to myself. Mm -hmm. I want the attention to be on the team because ultimately yeah. they're the ones who do everything. Yeah. So my celebration was more subdued in Tokyo, uh -huh. but more deeply meaningful to me. It just blew me away emotionally. Yeah. Uh, but my, the de my demonstrations of that uh, euphoria were muted mm -hmm. because I want the focus to be on our team, uh -huh. and especially that one. First ever Olympic yeah, gold medal. That's awesome. Second ever period of yeah. any major title. Yeah. And so I wanted the focus to be on our captain, Jordan Larson, yeah. and the other 11 people who helped make that happen, who were there, plus the other 12 who were part of a core group of 23 who were not there and also very impactful on who we were and, what, and how we played there. And so yeah. the focus I want to be as much as possible on the people who do the work on the court. That's beautiful. I, okay, maybe maybe you could take this suggestion. If you really want to go 100% karch mode, make a deal that if the players go higher karch mode, that you won't feel <laughs> as standing out and need to practice it in practice. They <laughs> they had a beautiful celebration. Uh, when Jordan Larson put that last ball oh, away, yeah. she fell to the floor. I'm getting massive goosebumps thinking about it, but she fell to the floor. Yeah. And then everybody gathered around her. And it wasn't so much a, yeah. like um, jumping up and down. It was just this momentous, absolutely historic moment yeah. and how heavy it was, how emotionally impactful it was. And you could see their love for each other in that yeah. moment. It was great. It was a unit, and it was with authority. I mean, yeah. that's what was awesome about well, it. They put together a great turn. The right person put, put away the final yeah. point. That's, so. that's what we're trying to do this year, and a whole lot of teams will have a lot to say about it, too. There's going to be a lot of great contenders. This could be the strongest Olympic field that we've seen. It's, it's deep. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Donnie, so much, Coach. Thanks. Good to see you. Yeah, you too.